Good. Thank you. Um, just while I'm getting oriented, I will pass my congratulations on to Nikolai. It's been a fantastic conference so far. I know we got a lot more to come. And thank you for all the, the great speakers so far. You've actually done a, a lot of the heavy lifting for my intro slides, so we can probably get through those quickly. Um, this one almost kind of seems redundant at this point. I think everybody here knows what an eyelid is. Uh, something I did want to bring up now that <clears throat> I have this up here is a question that Timo asked. And if we look at the architecture of a mouse versus a human eyelid, you can see that there is a lot more interaction between an alpha cell and a beta cell in a human eyelid, just because there's more alpha cells in a human eyelid. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story today about how we think alpha cells are important for regulating beta cells. And to answer your question, Timo, I think it's more important in human eyelids for a variety of reasons. And we can talk about that as we go. Um, this slide here sets up the canonical dogma around the various effects of insulin and glucagon. And we know this. When glucose goes up, beta cells secrete insulin to bring it back down. If glucose goes down, the alpha cells secrete glucagon to bring it back up. So these have been positioned for ever since uh, glucagon was discovered as, as uh, almost antagonistic against each other with respect to glu uh, glucose control. Um, and today I want to show you that maybe it's not that simple. So the story begins with Megan Capozzi, a postdoc, my first postdoc when I moved to Duke. And she had a couple of papers that started with a very simple question. If we look at the idea that alpha cells secrete glucagon, well, we know that there is a glucagon receptor on the beta cell. And she wanted to ask, what kind of interaction is that? There's been a lot of literature discussing how paracrine interactions within the islet uh, regulate function, but it's mostly beta cells to alpha cells or beta cells to delta cells and delta cells outward. Not a ton of, of literature on what the alpha cells are doing to beta cells, at least when we started this, this project. So, uh, what we know is, is not new. Glucagon is insulin tropic. It stimulates insulin pretty good. In fact, it was one of the first peptides that were uh, recognized well before we knew what incretins are to stimulate insulin secretion. And you can see that here in perifusion. That first uh, spike there is, is just glucose stimulated insulin secretion. And it's, you know, glucose stimulated insulin secretion is okay. It doesn't work very well. Um, but glucagon stimulates a lot of insulin secretion. So here's just a dose ramp going from uh, low to high concentrations of glucagon and the effect on insulin secretion. So first thing that Megan did was knock out the glucagon receptor and say, what does this do? Anticipating they should go away. And the, it was a funny finding. We didn't have it go away at all. Knocking out the glucagon receptor specifically in beta cells did absolutely nothing. In fact, this mouse has uh, an absolutely null phenotype. We have not found really anything interesting with it um, at all. Uh, what we do know is that glucagon can talk to more than one receptor, and we know it talks to the GLP-1 receptor. So when we blocked the GLP-1 receptor with Xcendin 9, we removed most of glucagon-stimulated insulin secretion. This is what Fiona was alluding to a couple talks ago. Uh, we do see some combination if we uh, put them together. That was we used Xcendin 9 in the uh, glucagon receptor knockout mouse. We can see a further decrease. So it's not that the glucagon receptor doesn't contribute to insulin secretion. When there is a functional open GLP-1 receptor, glucagon modulates much of its activity through that receptor. Okay, so this is, this is a, a fairly artificial system. We're giving glucagon exogenously humongous doses of glucagon. It's hard to predict what that means when you move into the islet. So to do so, we wanted to stimulate glucagon secretion from alpha cells. And uh, you'll see the two amino acids we chose back when we were doing this work were heavily influenced by what Danielle was doing. So we heard a lot about glutamine and arginine, and we were doing this back in 2016 and 17 when Danielle was telling her first story. Um, and so we, were, we used these two amino acids. We've now moved on. Uh, I think Danielle is right. They, the glutamine is not a great glucagon secreted gob. We moved on to alanine uh, for a variety of reasons, including some of the stuff that Nikolai has been doing. But here you can see that both of these amino acids stimulate insulin secretion quite robustly. So the question is, how much of that is because they're stimulating glucagon? To use another mouse, we generated a pro-glucagon null mouse that makes no glucagon at all. And you can ask, well, how much of the amino acid glucagon secretion drives the insulin secretion that you see here? And it's most of it. Almost all of the amino acid stimulated insulin secretion disappears if you don't have glucagon in the islet. We've done this approach through many orthogonal ways. So this is a pro-glucagon null mouse. We've done it with receptor knockouts. I'm going to show you some pharmacology in a minute 
Uh, it doesn't matter how you interrupt alpha to beta cell communication, you severely dampen amino acids stimulated insulin secretion. What was surprising to us was the effect on on insulin secretion or on glucose stimulated insulin secretion alone seen here. So that's, that's reduced by about 90%. We weren't expecting that. Um, while we were writing this up, uh, Jens had a paper in Cell Reports that basically scooped us and said the same thing. It said that uh, glucagon is absolutely necessary for insulin secretion. Not amino acid stimulating insulin secretion, but just insulin secretion. Uh, these are not dysfunctional islets. If we give them glucagon or GLP-1 or GIP back, they respond just fine. So it highlights that the defect you see in response to amino acids or to glucose is really because they're missing glucagon, not because they have some sort of defect. Uh, we can see this in humans. It's important to go from mice to humans. Uh, here is just a glucose ramp. We're using pharmacological antagonists, so extended 9 and a glucagon receptor antagonist. Uh, and it, it decreases glucose-stimulated insulin secretion and it also decreases amino acid stimulated insulin secretion. So in isolated islets, the conclusion from these stories was that glucagon is really important. Alpha to beta cell communication is really important for insulin secretion. Now you may be asking, well, how does this fit with the systemic physiology? So I'm showing you uh, alpha cells to beta cells and how important this is for insulin secretion, but we all know that glucagon also talks directly to the liver and has an opposing effect. So basically what the question I'm, I'm going to show you some data for is, is how do we uh, compare the glucagon effect on the liver versus its indirect effects by increasing insulin secretion? So we did some really simple physiology studies. Um, here's one that probably hundreds of papers uh, have done, and this is a glucagon challenge test. And most of these, if not all of them, are done by taking mice, fasting them, usually overnight, where their glycogen content is extremely low, give them a, a bolus of glucagon, and then measure how much the glucose goes up as a surrogate for hepatic glucagon activity. Now, the trick here is the, is the glucose. So if it's really, really low, down at 75 mg per deciliter, uh, that is below the threshold for GPCR activity in beta cells. That is, glucagon's insulinotropic activities are muted because they are glucose dependent. So it's not going to stimulate any insulin secretion. And you can see that here. This insulin secretion that we see here in response to glucagon is probably a product of the hyperglycemia rather than the glucagon itself. So what Megan did was ask a very simple question. What if I don't fast the mice? Now they have more glycogen content, which may shift the balance towards more glucagon activity in the hepatocytes but they also now can have glucagon act as an insulin tropic agent. And so you'll see that here. Same mice, just not fasted. Their glucose starts a little bit higher. Now glucagon can act on the insulin. You see a nice drive up here in insulin secretion, and now glucose goes down, not up. So that means the insulin tropic actions of glucagon are overcoming the hepatic actions to produce a net decrease in glycemia, not rise it up. We can do that here by, by uh, taking mice that don't have the receptors for glucagon specifically in the beta cells. They're not fasted, but glucagon can't act on the beta cells, so now it looks like they're a fasted mouse and glucose goes up. And then here was a fairly clever experiment by Megan. She used uh, sulfonylurea to activate the beta cells and bring them down to fasting levels. So now their glucose is below the threshold for a GPCR to work. But the KTP channels are closed because we close them with sulfur and urea. That activates the beta cells and allows the GPCR to work. So glucagon can now stimulate insulin secretion, and we see that here, and it produces an overall decrease in glucose levels. So it looks like systemically, if you can get enough activity on the beta cell from glucagon, it can actually decrease glucose, not raise it up. So what I've shown you here is the, the classic definition of the incretin effect is how gut peptides talk to the beta cells. So GIP and GLP-1 circulate and potentiate glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And what I've been talking to you about now is how the alpha cell also contributes to insulin secretion. So what I want to tell you in the last part of this story is how does the gut talk to the alpha cell? Does this have a role in postprandial metabolism? So Kim here had a really neat idea. She said, well, I'm learning about incretins when she joined the lab and she wanted to know how they work and, and we're doing incretin 101 and telling how they potentiate glucose stimulated insulin secretion. That is, they don't stimulate insulin secretion when glucose is low. They need the activated beta cell. And she said, well, maybe, maybe GIP, which is receptors expressed on the alpha cell, maybe it potentiates nutrient stimulated glucagon secretion. And uh, we know the nutrient for uh, alpha cells are amino acids, so she asked a simple question. Can GIP potentiate amino acid stimulated glucagon secretion? So here, uh, we've seen data like this. Danielle showed something like this, where you can see a biphasic response, and we're using alanine now. 
for glucagon secretion, a nice first phase and second phase. Uh, here's the effects of GIP alone. They're there. You can see it. It's just really squished down. But look what happens when she gives them together. There's a synergistic activity for GIP to potentiate alanine-stimulated glucagon secretion. We can see this in mice. So again, here is just controls. GIP has a little bit of an effect. Alanine, not so much. It's really hard to measure glucagon from a, from a tail because it just it doesn't circulate at very high concentrations. But when you put them together, we see a clear threefold increase in glucagon secretion. Moreover, if we do the same parameter here, GIP plus alanine, again, we're getting about a threefold in a wild type mice. If we make a mouse that has the GIP receptor deleted from the alpha cells, it all goes away. We can see this in human islets as well. So this is just taking, uh, these are non-diabetic islets uh, or donor from a non-diabetic donor. And the same thing where alanine and GIP are the blue and the green down here, they give you a little bit of an effect on glucagon secretion, but there's a clear synergy when you combine them together. So this translates from mice to humans, and we see a lot of glucagon secretion. Uh, the the y-axis here, I don't have the mice on here, but it's a lot higher simply because humans have, human islets have a lot more alpha cells. Okay, so most, most of what I just shown you right now was at low glucose. And we know that at high glucose, there's an inhibitory tone, and we can debate what that inhibitory tone is on the alpha cells, but really the alpha cells are a lot quieter. So when we, we wanted to do was see if any of the, what I'm talking about right now with GIP potentiating glucagon secretion first occurs at high glucose, and if it does, that does that allow it to engage alpha to beta cell communication to stimulate insulin secretion? So we did this with a mixed meal because we need amino acids to, to, uh, to activate the alpha cell. So first, I want to show you insulin secretion in isolated islets. So here, again, we're measuring insulin secretion. In response to glucose alone, you get a little bit of insulin secretion. Alanine potentiates that. That's alpha to beta cell communication. GIP alone has a direct effect on the beta cells. But when you put them together, you can see that in the red here you're getting more insulin secretion than you do with either alone. And this is important to note that this is 10 nanomolar GIP. This is uh, about one order of magnitude above, in our hands, a dose response curve for insulin secretion, which is about one nanomolar is maximal in this system. So we went above and beyond. That's the maximum effects of GIP on the beta cell alone. And because it's engaging the alpha cell, it can go above and beyond that. This is specific for GIP, so there was a discussion whether GLP-1 is working in the alpha cells. We did the same thing, and we don't see any additivity if we just swap out GIP for GLP-1. So if there is any activity of GLP-1 in the alpha cell, it's not sufficient enough to drive the mechanism that I'm telling you right now. So GIP has both direct and indirect effects, so there's a cartoon showing that here. In wild-type mice, when we have glucose alone, this is the direct effect of GIP. This is working directly on the beta cell through the GIP receptor on the beta cell to give us this level of insulin secretion. If we do it in the presence of alanine, we can get more insulin secretion. And again, this is a maximum concentration, so going above and beyond is, is, in, is, uh, is suggesting that we have a secondary mechanism here. Here we can remove the direct effects by doing it in a mouse that doesn't have the GIP receptor only in the beta cell. So we published a paper, the, the paper that I published uh, right before I left Dan's lab was showing that if you knock out the GIP receptor in the beta cell, you lose the insulin tropic effects. And we can repeat that here so we don't have to go and retract that paper. But if we include alanine and allow GIP to have a secondary effect, working through the alpha cell, you can see now GIP stimulates insulin secretion in a mouse that doesn't have a GIP receptor in the beta cell. Again, highlighting that there are direct versus indirect effects. And to really emphasize this point, we did it in the knockouts again, but with the presence of extended 9 to remove this secondary effect, and all of the effects go away. So GIP is no longer able to stimulate insulin secretion, showing that it has two ways of doing it. So what are the physiological implications? Again, I want to take this back to mimicking something that's postprandial. So when we look at the ways we measure postprandial glucose tolerance, there are really three physiological tests. The one that is probably the most common is an IP glucose tolerance test. Easiest one to do. Most people who have worked with mice have probably done some version of this. You can just give them an interperitoneal injection of glucose. You'll see the glucose goes up and it comes down. If you give it into, if you give it orally, the area under the curve shown here is less, and that's because there is more insulin. This is classic incretin effect. If you give guts, if you give glucose through the gut, incretin stimulate insulin secretion, lower glycemia. With a meal tolerance test, this is an insure test. We match the carbohydrate, the glucose load exactly. 
If anything, there is more carbon going in because we're giving amino acids and fat on top of it. This gives us more insulin secretion and it stimulates glucagon secretion. To highlight that this is including the alpha to beta cell communication, we did this in our mice that are missing the GIP receptor in the alpha cell. Doesn't have any impact on an IP glucose tolerance test on either the insulin or the glucagon. It's because this GIP is not really circulating this test. In an oral glucose tolerance test, we get an increase in GIP, but there's no amino acids to unlock the alpha cell. So it looks exactly like a control animal. However, when we do a mixed meal tolerance test, they're no longer able to lower their glucose any further because there is no glucagon secretion and the insulin secretion actually matches quite nicely with the oral glucose tolerance test. It's unable to get more insulin secretion. The indirect effects from alpha to beta cell communication are missing. So this is what I'm showing you here. This is the overall effect. Uh, we would argue that the full incretin effect in response to a meal that we all just had at lunch that includes amino acids, if you got the salmon, uh, has both direct and indirect effects of GIP, which I think it's becoming obvious that it's, it's a, uh, the major physiological incretin hormone. It can work both on the beta cell, but it can also work through the alpha cell, initiate alpha to beta cell communication through these two receptors, and you get more insulin secretion to control glucose. I will just thank the people. I think I called them out, Megan and Kim and our collaborators and funding, um, and happy to take any questions. I think your, your responses to glucose, they are, um, I think, exceptionally phasic. Normally, you will get a little bit more biphasic, but your responses to glucose, they look, I mean, almost ent only exclusively of first phase insulin secretion. So what is different in, I mean, yes. that's, of course, perfect for, your, for the, the, the questions you ask, but it's still a little bit different from what, what other people see. Yeah, so I can answer that three ways. One is is uh, a lot of those y-axis are stretched out because when we start to give peptides, we have to go way up. So if you look down, you can see differentiation. We're also using 10 millimolar, not 16 or higher as a lot of people do, uh, which will give us a higher second phase. We can see that there as well. So we're just, we're just activating the beta cell. Uh, and, the, and if you saw the human islet data, they have a clear second phase. So I don't think it's a technical issue. No, I don't think so. I'm just yeah. Well, to, to answer it one other way, getting back to Timo's point, that is one example why I think alpha to beta cell communication is more important in humans is because their second phase is demonstrably higher because they already have more of that communication. If I may uh, uh, just ask one question about the, the alanine effect in, in the alpha cells, that's also remarkably phasic. So mm -hmm. it shoots up and it goes down and then you apply G. So the questions are, why does glu uh, glucose secretion stop and what is the mechanism by which it uh, potentiates the, the secretion? Yeah, so, so the mechanism we're working on, it's, it's definitely cyclic AMP generated. CAMP, I think, may be even more important in an alpha cell than it is in a beta cell. Uh, we've generated a GS knockout in the alpha cell, and it's a, it's a remarkable mouse. It just basically does not secrete glucagon at all. It looks, we have a beta cell version of it, as, uh, and, and the similarities between glucagon and insulin are quite remarkable. Uh, how cyclic AMP is interacting with amino acid-stimulated glucagon secretion is an answer I don't have. I think, I think that needs to be worked out. Wonderful talk, Sean. So do you have an idea why glucagon hijacks the GLP-1 receptor in the beta cell? Uh, well, maybe because we could have called it the glucagon receptor and we wouldn't say it's hijacking it, it's, is one answer. Uh, maybe that's the important uh, receptor for glucagon. I think not to answer your question with a question, but why is there a glucagon receptor remains a mystery to me. But why is it not uh, then decreasing body weight via the GLP-1 receptor? Oh, yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. I, again, this is my personal bias. I don't think glucagon is meant to get much out of the por portal circulation. I think it does all its activity in the islet and the liver, and it doesn't really make it to the brain. Even GLP-1 doesn't really make it to the brain, right? That, that is really, to, to coin your term, hijacking. That's pharmacology. Last question. Yeah, hi John. That was a that was a great presentation. Um, I know with the glucagon receptor knockout mice, you're going to get alpha cell hyperplasia usually, and this kind of um, complementary increase in uh, circulating amino acids, which then could feed into this alpha cell uh, hyperplasia. Um, is there any uh, information or knowledge out there that has essentially given GIP, where GIP was given pharmacologically, and um, the resulting 
increase in insulin is greater than uh, a wild type mouse, or does this hyper cell um, like the the hyperplasia kind of correlate then with an increase in insulin secretion due to GIP? So are you asking if we if we gave a mouse a GRA and gave them more alpha cells, would we magnify the effects that we're seeing here? I I haven't done it. I don't think any. I haven't. I'm not aware of anybody who's done it. it makes sense to me. I mean, it probably makes it look more like a human islet where you just, it's even more. I mean, it's like 90% alpha cells by the time you give a GRA. So I would imagine it works unless there's already so much alpha cell tone because not only is glucagon going up, but that is a case where there is GLP-1 being made in the alpha cell at that point. Um, and I think you probably are going to get pretty close to maximal saturation of the GLP-1 receptor just because of sheer volume. So I can see it going either way.